Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us on this Wisdom Dharma chat. And thank you to the live audience for joining us. And most of all, thank you, Jimpala, for joining us once again on the Wisdom Dharma chat. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to have you here tonight, once again. Same here. And um, tonight I wanted to take this opportunity to, you know, celebrate the, you know, recent publication of uh, this new volume in this remarkable series, the Library of Tibetan Classics. And uh, this, uh, you know, this, this series is actually a testament to the rich literary heritage of the Tibetan, um, you know, Tibetan Buddhism and Tibet in general, yeah. <clears throat> and so I was hoping maybe you could say a few words about this particular volume. Okay, thank you. Um, I mean, those who are, you know, some of you are familiar with the Library of Tibetan Classics series will know that there are 32 volumes in this, and the first few uh, are, you know, sort of specifically uh, <clears throat> there to represent the sort of, you know, key instructions of the major Tibetan traditions. So within that, you know, collects uh, part, this volume, I think it's volume six, isn't it? Um, in the Library yes, of Tibetan Classics exactly. series, yeah. It represents the core teachings of the Geluk school. So up to now, we have published the volume on the Saiga Lamrian cycle of teachings. We have published the Kagyu Mahamudra and Six Yogas of Naropa. Um, we have, um, so this is the Geluk version. The Nyingma version is going to be uh, the major commentary on Semning also by Long Chempa, which is still being edited. And then there is the Mind Training, Lojong Gyatsa, the collection as the first one, and then followed by a volume on Kadam school. So, um, so this is the latest one in the series. And this one is particularly on the Giluk school. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was personally involved in the selection of the text here. I consulted Bodhi Solanis and uh, my own, one of my own teachers, Jalati mm -hmm. <laughs> So uh, this volume is divided into several sections. Uh, the first one is really uh, the section on uh, Lamrim, the stages of the path, which is signature practice and instructions of the Giluk school, you know, tracing from the Kadampas. And then the second part is uh, Guru Yoga practice, uh, primarily represented by the 100 deities, Guru Yoga, Kandalayama, and uh, uh, Panchalama Losan Chagin's Lama Chopa, the Guru Puja, which is the two main uh, traditions. And then uh, Panchalama's Guru Puja has a very extensive commentary by uh, a great meditator by the name of Gyaru in Nima, or sometimes called Chadel. And Chadel means do nothing. So it's basically <laughs> someone who has given up the world and is a hermit and has nothing else to do. <laughs> so Chadel means no job, no task. Uh, so he wrote a, a beautiful commentary. So that's there. And then the next part is a section on um, Makiluk Mahamudra. Again, the root text by Panchalama and his own auto commentary. And then the final part is um, um, a particular text, uh, genre of practice instructions known as the three essential uh, practices of the three essential points of, you know, uh, when you are alive at the point of death and preparation for the uh, parto. So this is a, a particular instruction that became hugely influential in the Giluk school in the early days. And it's an instruction based on uh, advanced highest yoga tantra version of Avalokiteshvara practice. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, the lineage comes from uh, Mitra Zogi, Mitra Yogi, who came to Tibet in the 13th century, mm -hmm. invited by Tobolo Tawa. And this Mitra Zogi's instruction in general, and particularly the, the three essential practices became very influential and became influential in, in the Giluk tradition. So this is an attempt to provide a fairly comprehensive, not completely comprehensive set of texts. And these are also the texts which are typically taught in all the major monasteries, all the major Dharma centers. And these are the main texts that are practiced in the Guluk tradition as well. So, and I'm so, you know, happy to see this finally in print. Mm -hmm. You know, many of my, you know, Guluk Ishi colleagues have been telling me, you know, when is the Gilu one coming? When is the Gilu one coming? <laughs> so, and they keep saying that you will do so many. Sorry about that. We're just yeah, having some so, feedback. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, so I'm finally happy to see this in print, you know, and, um, you know, to, to assist the reader to have a broader context, I also took the opportunity to write quite a lengthy essay in the form of introduction, um, because these texts also represent my own personal practice. So I'm in a much more confident position to be writing about this particular volume. So I took the opportunity to, instead of writing a separate book, I wrote a quite a lengthy uh, intro as well. And, and particularly, you know, I'm very interested in, in addition to the actual instructions of the practices, but actually the underlying psychology. What is being envisioned here? What are the key faculties being cultivated and called upon? And what is the theory of transformation or change, you know, behind these kind of practices? So uh, I've tried to flesh these out mm. uh, in, in this, um, in, in the introduction. So it's a real joy to see this finally. The science is pretty intimidating, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's, it's, what you've done is capture both the, you know, spiritual and intellectual brilliance of this Kalug school, which had such a profound impact on Tibetan Buddhism. Yes. So I think this is a very special volume. And also because you translated that. Yes. Someone so well, not all of them. There are two texts translated by um, Rosemary Patton oh, okay. and uh, her teacher, uh, with the assistant yeah. of her teacher, Thakur yeah. Bumjen. So the uh, Gampo, there is a Thakur Bumjen's text, uh, one of the earliest mm -hmm. Lamrim instructions, mm -hmm. uh, but it's oh, entirely yeah. written in verse. Uh, and it's, it's a beautiful text. Um, and the reason why it was written in verse is to help practitioners memorize them. Um, and it's a very early text, so it was translated by, and Thakur Rinpoche has connection with that, yes. you know, the monastery of that author. And then the second text, which the team did was uh, Fifth Dalai Lama's um, Sacred Words of Manjushri. Yeah. So the two of these I outsourced, yes. um, but the rest is all done. Oh, yeah. yeah, incredible, incredible. I don't know how you do so much, actually. <laughs> We're gonna ask you a secret tonight about how you get so much done. Uh, but one, one of the questions I did have was, uh, how you not, not only decided the text, but decided the structure, the Lam Ram, the Guru Yoga, the Ma Mudra, and then this, you know, view text. How, how did you come to that? Well, it's structure? kind of, there's a kind of a suggestion of a progression, mm. because Lam Ram is the fund, foundational text to help you prepare. Um, there's a kind of a saying that Lam Ram practice, Lam Ram teachings, when they are comprehensive, should begin from assisting the practitioner to turning their mind towards the Dharma. So that's the first step. If you don't take interest in Dharma, you're not going to do <laughs> to the practice. So first of all, you're turning your mind to the Dharma, you know, Lobo Chul Teva. So turning your minds, I mean, the Tibetan literally means the turning the head of your mind to the Dharma. That really has to be a very important one because that crucial step has to, you have to mean it. Mm. And the Lamrim instructions really, you know, sort of uh, emphasize that. So the Lamrim is supposed to start from, even though Atisha's Lamrim starts from the three scopes, the three capacities, but the Tibetan Lamrim generally would start from inspiring you to practice. That's one of the reasons why right at the beginning, there is the, you know, relationship with the guru. There is also the uh, contemplation upon the value and preciousness of human existence to really emphasize the sense of urgency, the appreciation of the opportunity that you have been given as birth as a human being. And so that your turning to the Dharma really will be a serious one. So that's why I think Lamrim is there. And, and then the Guru Yoga is on a practical level, you know, everybody does Guru Yoga mm. for one form or another. So that in Tibetan tradition, the Guru Yoga practice goes all the way back to very early stages in Nyingma and Kagyu tradition. Instead of Guru Yoga, it's called cultivation of Guru, Ladu. Yeah. So it's, it's a different terminology. And in fact, the term Guru Yoga, you know, I mentioned in my intro, I found only two or three references in the Indic texts, mm -hmm. very, very late. Um, so the term seems to have become much more popularized in Tibet, but in any case, Tibetan tradition, regardless of whether you have taken a Vajrayana initiation or not, anyone who practices Tibetan Buddhism mm. starts from Guru Yoga of some kind. Mm. And uh, so I think having that 
included there um, is an important one to really point out these are the practices that everybody does. And then the Mahamudra um, is in some sense, you know, the, in the Giluk version, uh, Mahamudra is understood as kind of advanced practice of meditating upon the nature of mind. And it's, that's it's also the meaning in which the Kagyu tradition, which is what, which is the tradition that most emphasized the Mahamudra practice also understands it this way. But the, in the Giluk tradition, Mahamudra practice is really seen as a somehow sub genre or related to the overall guide of the view practice, which is the meditation on emptiness. So I think that inclusion of that was important. And then finally, um, I happen to be a fan of the three essential points <laughs> practices myself. Um, ever since I first took the instruction from Tepju when I was 22 or something, I was very struck by the simplicity of this. It's a basically a uh, practice of guru deity and meditation on emptiness and preparation for parto. It's a, it seems to capture, and it's a very short practice. Yeah. And for those of us in contemporary time, everybody's chasing after time, something having like that short formula seems to be very appealing. So I put it in there. And I was a little disappointed at how, even though the the Nimbu Tensum, the three essential you know, points practice seems to have been quite influential at one point in the Galuk tradition. It doesn't seem to be taught that extensively today. So that my insistence on including that in the volume is also to point to the Lamas and the Gishi and say, hey, you know, just look, let's not forget this too, yeah, <laughs> kind <yeah>. of thing. <laughs> what is it particularly about this practice? Obviously, you know, the context with, within which you received it, I remember the other night we were talking about Song Rinpoche. Yes. We were describing how powerful he yeah, was. He was. Maybe yes. you could say yeah. a few words about yeah. that, and then this particular practice. Well, I think the, the one of the attractive things about the three essential points practice is that the, the kind of the, the lineage and the history of it is it's a Mitra Jogi coming to Tibet, mm. and it's based on a personal revelation of vision of um, you know Avalokiteshvara. Navalushter Teshvara is very important for Tibetan Buddhism and Tibetans in general. So to have an Avalokiteshvara practice in the form of advanced highest yoga tantra and the distillation of the practice itself in such simple forms mm. of three points seems to be very attractive. Mm. You know, I think that's probably one of the reasons why it became quite influential and widespread in the Giluk tradition as well. Um, so that was my main kind of just the just the combination, and then of course having it received from Song Rinpoche made a big uh, difference. Yeah. Can you describe Song Rinpoche? He looks a little bit like a wizard from the first. Yes, uh, those of you who might have known him, he was very impressive. He had this very round kind of eyes. You know, a striking feature. You know, absolutely immaculately white goatee beard. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know when he when he when he looks at you when he talks I mean it's like his piercing eyes are just completely cut you through, and he had this amazing memory when he tells a story, he would tell the story as if he was there witnessing it. So of course, as a young monk, you know, receiving teachings from him, you know sometimes you will get ten percent teaching and ninety percent is story. <laughs> <laughs> that kept everyone glued to the yeah, story. Yeah. yeah. So um, I've asked Jimbala to uh, pick a selection to read for us tonight. And so Jimbala, can you tell us a little bit about the selection and why you chose yeah. this particular reading? Well, I thought it's a bit. Yeah, we're going to yeah. get a feedback. So. Um, you know, you might have actually guessed a little bit at the beginning when we we're talking about mm -hmm. the selection of text there. My, the level of my voice increased when I was talking about this commentary on Lama Chirpa text by this do nothing, you know, <laughs> Chadel Chudung Nima. So I thought I would read, I thought I would read from uh, him. His text is a long one. Um, and I'll explain in a minute why I chose that, yeah. Page 586. Yeah, page 586. So, um, so you might, you might. We might just pause for a sec. And we might cut to the speaker.
let's cut the speaker. We can speak loudly, and this will go through. That'll be no yeah. problem, yeah? Because I think everyone's ears have had enough of this. <laughs> so maybe we don't, if I, I just don't, shout. We'll, we'll shout. Yeah. yeah. I when we shout. did the sound check, we weren't as excited about the, <laughs> we weren't reading from the text. So. Okay, is it fine now? Yeah, I think we're good. Okay. Let's go. Okay. So uh, this is from page 586, and this is his lengthy commentary on um, Lama Chirpa, which has a beautiful title. It says, A Letter of Final Testament Sent Upon the Wind. So he's a, imagine a yogi, you know, up in the mountains, you know, he's writing this based on his own personal practice as if he's not going to see anyone, <laughs> as he just wants to send it away through the wind. So he says, now, if while meta awareness is monitoring, so he's talking about the shamatha practice here, okay, cultivating single pointedness of the mind in relation to mind. Now, if while meta awareness is monitoring, you see that the mind is abiding on the meditation object as placed, then let your mind rest as it is in a relaxed way. If in contrast, the mind is not abiding and has lost the vibrancy of its mode of apprehension, you then need to revive vibrancy and then continue with your meditation. When the hindrances of mental scattering and excitation occur, you should, while ensuring the meditative object is not lost from the field of your mindfulness, use a small part of your mind to apply any of the following three distinct methods. So it's, you know, imagine you're sitting in a relaxed way, you're alert, there's no excitation occurring, your mind is calm. He's, he's saying, look, as, look at this, you know, so, so if some excitation, kind of the mind starts to get a bit more restless, he says, look at, look as it were, at the face of the distracting thoughts themselves. So instead of pushing that way, just look at them. Or two, trample on the thoughts, or simply observe how the thoughts arise. When the thoughts naturally dissolve as a result, when you do any of these three things, then let your mind rest in that state that is unobscured, empty, clear, and vivid. You might ask, with what kind of body and mind should I apply such distinctive mindfulness and that awareness? Answer, what you need is this. On the surface, there should be a relaxed letting go of effort, both of the body and mind. Yet underneath, you should maintain an alert mode of apprehension with firmness. My father guru himself says, now he's quoting from his own personal teacher, it's Palama, Father Guru. My Father Guru himself says, he quotes, on the surface, keep your mind in a relaxed state. At the core, however, maintain alertness in your mind. This is how learn it and realized, sorry, uh, this is how you should meditate. And then he goes on to say that this very approach is taught repeatedly by many learned and realized teachers, such as Chandra Gomin, Saraha, Magic Lapram and so on, end of quote. So it's, you can see that, he, you know, this, he, the meditator is really trying to describe the process and what to do. And one of the touching things about this is that even he himself was an advanced meditator who spent years as a hermit, he's still citing his guru <laughs> as a kind of a final authority. You know, so that's, which is really, and it's touching because he says yeah. father guru. Yeah, father, father guru. Yeah, Palama. 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 Yeah. This is very touching. Um, one of the things I want to say is that don't be confused by this book, right? This looks like a book for scholars, you know, this big, thick book. But this is a book for yogis, actually. Yeah, yeah. This is practitioners. All yeah. practitioners. Yeah. This is a book for practitioners. And, uh, and one of the things that strikes me from this passage, it's very interesting, is that normally we think of this spectrum of being, you know, awake to being asleep. Yeah. So there's one dimensional spectrum. Sure. You're either wired or tired, yeah. right? But here we're looking at something else. Yeah. If there's a different dimension where you can be relaxed yeah. and alert. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so this is some sort of, there's like an orth orth orthogonal sort of spectrum yeah. here. Spectrum, yeah. And so I'm thinking, um, so if you're relaxed and alert, 
what does what does that look like in terms of um, how do we be both relaxed and alert based on instructions like this? Well, in some ways, um, what the author is trying to capture is this concept of equanimity that comes up in the Yogacara writings. Um, and it comes up particularly in Maitreya and Asanga's instruction on cultivating shamatha, uh, um, you know, calm abiding, tranquil abiding. They talk about, you know, this equanimity, not in the sense of absence of bias. That's one sense of equanimity, like in the four immeasurables, when they talk about immeasurable equanimity, they're talking about absence of emotional biases, of attachment and aversion. So that's one type. But when, when, you know, when yoga, uh, masters like Asanga and Vasubandhu are talking about equanimity in the context of a meditation, they are talking about a different sense of equanimity. And that is kind of an equanimity in the sense of a state of mind that is not, you know, because modern psychologists speak of levels of arousal. Mm. So like anger is a highly aroused state of mind. Depression is a very low aroused state of mind. So this contemporary emotion science concept of level of arousal versus emotional valence, which is like this. So if you have a cross like this, arousal is on the top to bottom and the valence of negativity to positivity, not in the sense of moral sense, but of how you feel, good or bad, is the valence of the sort of the color of the emotion. Mm. So that concept, if you apply this, when they are talking about this calm, alert, relaxed, they're really talking about this arousal level where you want to find that midpoint. Mm. The, the, the level of arousal isn't overexcited, nor is low, or, you know, which goes into depression. And here in the Abhidhamma, we just finished this yes. recording of uh, Abhidhamma psychology course. Um, in the masters like Asanga and, and Vasubandhu speak of three states, stages in the attainment and in, in the perfection of this equanimity quality of mind. The first one, they call it evenness of mind. Second, they call it stillness. And third, they call it effortlessness. So the idea here is that at the beginning, you know, it's going to be a struggle you know, to really find that balance. And then often you may find it for a few seconds, and then your mind immediately shifts the energy to either highly aroused or low. And then you, as you practice, you get better at it, and then you are able to prolong that stage of being in this midpoint where there is alertness. And then you get to a point where you can actually lengthen the period. So that's the stillness. But even there, even though they may, you may be in that state, there is still the lingering concern of relapsing. Yeah. So through you know, practice, you will eventually get to a point where it becomes effortless. And also there is no longer any concern. Mm -hmm. And of course, in the traditional Tibetan text, the true attainment of shamatha is defined by someone's capacity to remain unwavering. Mm -hmm. On a chosen object for four hours. Yeah. I mean, that's <laughs> that's a lot. <laughs> so even if you can stay a minute, yes, that's a lot. Now two minutes is even quite good. And people think two minutes is nothing, but two minutes. You know, I'm a Canadian, so we the ice hockey is a big deal. <laughs> and in, you know, when there is a penalty, penalty lasts for two minutes. In two minutes, you could lose a game yeah. or win a game. Yeah. So. And if you are able to really imagine being able to keep your mind in this relaxed alertness, what they what the masters call evenness or stillness of mind for two minutes, yeah. imagine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. No, this uh, this idea of relaxed and alert sounds like that's that's the state we yeah. want to be in. Yeah. yeah. And um, so then also there's this you mentioned effortlessness. Yeah. And so then there's this um, sort of question about what to do with effort. For example, uh, normally you think to be relaxed, you reduce your effort. Sure, sure. To be alert, you increase your sure, effort. Sure. So in this, when you're trying to achieve this uh, meditative sort of equanimity of uh, balance of, you know, relaxed, but alert, yeah. what are we doing with effort in this situation? Well, I think generally, the, at least in the Giluk instructions that I'm familiar with, um, the much, much of the exertion of effort is done at the level of intention at mm -hmm. the beginning. 
when you sit down to meditate, you actually assert your will and intention quite forcefully. But in the actual session, you are supposed to let go. So I think it's probably, it's, I, don't, I don't think it's either or. Uh, and for the beginner stage, every now and then, you will have to reapply your effort. But effort itself is not a problem. But on the other hand, when you consciously need to apply effort, you are going to get distracted because mm -hmm. it's an energy that you have to assert. Mm -hmm. But I, my sense is that as you get more and more advanced in your practice, the application of effort requires less and less assertion. Mm -hmm. And simple conscious awareness itself will bring that mm -hmm. energy. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. That's so ni nicely explained. And then if we were to be in this space, even for two minutes. Yeah. Right? A minute, a minute. I, I would like yeah. hopefully for like <laughs> 10 seconds, yeah. Yeah, uh, something. What makes this uh, practice related to the view? Well, there is this very, very beautiful quotation attributed to the Buddha in one of the sutras, where the Buddha says that when the mind is relaxed and settled, then you will see reality as it is. Mm. So there is this idea that you know, in our normal, everyday, ordinary state of mind, our mind is constantly up and down and up and down, and it has no chance to actually settle down. So in, in that state of fluctuating state of mind, whatever knowledge you're going to get, it's always going to be fleeting because it doesn't get a chance to imprint. But once you are able to cultivate this evenness and stillness of the mind, all of that unnecessary energy that is exertion is going to be gone. So then the mind in its own natural state, then you have a chance to see its reality as it is. And then of course, the more you are informed of the basic Buddhist teachings on impermanence and no self, of course that is presupposed because if you don't have any cultivation of those, I don't think there is a magic that happens like this. You know, it sort of presupposes that you have been exposed to Buddha's teaching of no self, impermanence, interdependence, and all of this. But even if we have intellectually cultivated that knowledge, but if our mind are never rested, and then the impact of these knowledge is never going to be that deep. So I think the Buddha statement, you know, when your mind is relaxed and rested in a peaceful way, you will see reality as it is. It's a beautiful one, actually. Mm. Yeah, it's, it, there is a real, there's a, there's a real value because, mm. uh, you know, because whatever you contemplate, you're going to be able to contemplate in a deeper way. Mm. Very nice. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, so, you know, you selected these texts, translated these texts, feel very close to these texts, and then you selected this particular passage yeah. for us tonight. And so, would I be right in assuming that this may be a little bit of what uh, Jimbala is doing in his practice <laughs> in the day? Like, is this a sort of, like, is this, uh, does this inform your practice? These, oh, yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. I mean, I don't, you know, to be honest, I've never been a big meditator. Yeah. You know, I don't spend hours. I've done my share of retreats, um, especially the Vajrayana ones, um, because you have to be able to perform the rituals. You have to do the retreats of, uh, you know, Guru Samaja, Yamantaka. Uh, all of these, uh, as Ryogini and Hayagri, I've done all of them. And I've also done the basic mundro practice of Guru Yoga, uh, you know, reciting 100,000 uh, times Tsongkhapa's uh, Mithima and, um, verse. Uh, but beyond that, my own daily practice uh, is, you know, not sadhana. Mm -hmm. it's, um, I do sadhana once in a while, but I, it's, it's more about uh, shamatha practice. Mm -hmm. um, you know, starting with the intention setting. Then do I do my uh, Gandalagyam or Guru Yoga. Mm. Then I do the full immeasurables practice. Mm. And then I do a quiet sitting practice for 10 minutes. Um, and then I do a kind of a deeper view practice. Mm. Um, and then I end with um, eight verses of training the mind and Bodhicitta practice. So that's my daily practice. And then where I find practice in some ways more impactful is in the day-to-day -day life actually. I mean, it's, you know, I constantly read and uh, so you know, I'm a big fan of the Indian Buddhist classics. You know, like, so, so my part of my practice is not confined to sitting. 
this is a day in the life of Jimba. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Um, I can't help but ask. You said, and then at some point you do a deeper view practice. Yeah. What is that? What is that like? What is well, that? it's um, you know, um, you know, I will I will either read the, the, the Heart Sutra, uh, do it, or I'll take a passage from uh, Nagarjuna's uh, or the Karika. Uh, you know, so I choose one or from a verse from Tsongkhapa. Uh, and then His Holiness sometimes says that you can even use the eight verses on mind training because it starts with Danis and Jentam Jela. In the Tibetan version, the first word in this eight verses of mind training is self. So he, he, he says you can just chant the first line, Danis and Jentam Jela, and then you stop there and you analyze the self. Mm. <laughs> you know, I haven't done that because for me, eight verses mind training is. I don't associate it too much with the view. Yeah, yeah. It's more the heart bodhicitta practice. So you're getting something that really you can get the taste of. Yeah. And then you're um, getting that yeah. feeling, that inspiration. And, yeah. And then that becomes your practice. Yeah. Nice. And then so this is your, your daily practice. And then you like to bring it into your day. Yeah. And then what about bringing it into your work? You're so prolific, like all these books, all the, you're filming a course. Um, how do you bring, well, where do you find time? Like, so then in your day, when are you writing? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I may be revealing a bit too much of myself, but um, yeah, um, I like to get up early in the morning. And uh, when I was in the monastery, I wasn't considered an early riser mm. because I get up around 6.30. And in the monasteries, people get up around 4.30 or 5. So I was a late riser. But when I moved to the West, mm. I was in first time in early class. <laughs> <laughs> so I get up around 6.30 and then after, you know, um, my breakfast around seven, I spend an hour, um, first half hour practice, another hour or half reading from, you know, quietly. And that's when, you know, nobody's up in the time, you know, at home and it's a very quiet time. And then I, start my work around either 8 30 or 9 and then when i'm working i'm actually quite focused i don't touch my emails until i've done three or four hours of work or two hours of work at least um, because emails the moment you open it you get reactive and so many things but if you don't know i've always you know this had this kind of been very clear about the morality for example like um, <clears throat> in the old days you know when people had landlines telephone mm -hmm. there was an answer machine or or the, the the caller id and i refuse to have caller id because if you have a caller id and if you know someone's calling if you don't pick it up you feel bad but on the other hand if you don't have a caller id you don't know who's calling <laughs> and if you, if you don't feel like picking it up you don't feel bad so same principle applies yeah. to email yeah. i don't touch email unless i you know consciously so I spent the first two or three hours work very productively. Mm -hmm. And because I have been very fortunate to be able to work on the kind of work that I do, and you know, Eric is here, Eric's foundation mm -hmm. has supported me, Nita Eden's foundation has supported my work. And I'm very privileged to be able to really kind of work, do the work that I do. And because there is a joy in the work that I do, and I noticed that when there is joy, there's much less tiredness. And it's a simple fact of human psychology. So, you know, I, people sometimes, like some of my Tibetan colleagues accuse me of being workaholic, but I would rather take that badge, you know? <laughs> because if I'm stressed and then still working, and then of course it's something else, but I actually enjoy it. Mm. It's very rewarding. And also many of the, Tibetan text editing work, you know, I, I feel very grateful and to have this opportunity. And also sort of I rejoice in the possibility that with my reformatting and editing of these texts, these texts will be used for generations to come. Mm. So that's the kind of, um, you know, I mean, Tsongkhapa says that rejoicing is the cheapest way to earn good, <laughs> good merit, you know? So, um, and I think that's probably, and I work probably um, eight to nine hours a day. Wow. Yeah, or eight, eight and a half hours. Yeah. The secret is like finding joy in your yeah. work. Yeah, 
And weekends, I don't touch email. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, and then I don't work during the weekends, but I, I do read. So. Yeah. so, this word joy it seems like a, one of the favorite words of yours. Yes. And yeah. also, you know, something that people associate with His Holiness, the yes, Dalai yes, as well. Yes. Yeah. And so, um, how do you, so is rejoicing one of the practices that bring you joy? Is there other ways yeah. that you sort of raise joy in your life? Well, I think if you have to see the purpose of what you're doing, you know, so that's, you know, once you see the purpose of what you're doing, the work can be very fulfilling. So that's, you know, joy need not necessarily be an elated sense of, you know, pleasant experience. Joy can also take the form of a deep sense of fulfillment. So that's what I mean by joy. You know, you know, sometimes there's a pleasant experience that goes with it, but it need not necessarily be accompanied by a pleasant experience. Yeah, so there's this relationship between meaning and joy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and it's closely associated with some of the stuff you've been talking about in the course, How Your yes. Mind Works. Exactly. So we've been filming this course with Jim Pala. It's called How Your Mind Works, and it goes through all the different Buddhist psychology. Yeah. And Jimpa was telling us about these two sort of mental activities of the mind one shraddha, yes. aspiration, is it? it uh, no, faith. No, Translated faith, faith, as faith. Yes. Faith. Shraddha and, and chanda. chanda. Yeah. And so having this faith and having uh, aspiration. aspiration. Yeah. So um, maybe, we can, maybe we can talk a little bit about the course and your, your ideas behind why this course and, and, and how some of these things like um, aspiration come into your daily practice. Well, the, the, we just finished filming the Abhidhamma course, How the Mind Works, Buddhist psychology of, uh, Abhidhamma psychology of mental factors. And, um, you know, mental factors taxonomy is studied in the monastery fairly early. Actually, young monks, it's part of the uh, vocabulary building, you know, if you want, you know, because many of the debate training, the typology of mind, logic, and science of reasoning, that is the basics of logic, all of these are designed in the, in the monastery for early education to really train the mind. And a large part of those kind of trainings are aimed at providing the vocabulary for the young monks as they learn. Now, when we bring that to the international audience, like English speaking audience, then a little bit of work needs to be done because the structure and the level and the approach that is in the traditional approach doesn't work because traditional approach is designed for kids. So, uh, so for to bring it to the international audience, you really need to dig into the deeper psychology that is in the classical texts, like the 51 mental factors from you know, Asanga is embedded in Abhidhamma Samuchaya, which is Asanga's main text on Abhidhamma. And a large part of that aspect of uh, taxonomy and the individual mental factors, particularly the afflicted ones, are much more thoroughly discussed in its bigger Yogacara texts. So the, in the course, what I did was to go back to the sources and then dig out the underlying psychology and, and then flesh them out for the you know, international audience, which by definition, we expect them to be adults, mm -hmm. you know, educated Buddhist <laughs> audience. <laughs> Um, so, and when you do that, then you begin to see some very interesting kind of, you know, psychological insights. For example, there is a big um, point that, in, in fact, uh, Shantideva brings out in his Guide to the Bodhisattva way, more specifically in training, a compendium of training, Shiksha Samuchaya, uh, where he says that, um, you know, he has a theory of motivation there. He says, if you really want to do something in a committed way, the first stage is to really cultivate the awareness of the virtue, the value of that, the benefit of that. When you see the benefit in a truly deep way, then you're going to get inspired. And then he uses the word shraddha, which is faith, but faith is not a good word here. You know, faith in the sense of a confidence or trust. When that happens, then your interest will peak, you know, your aspiration will arise. When aspiration is there, enthusiasm comes. Mm -hmm. When enthusiasm is there, then there's the motivation and you act. Yeah. And, and a key part of that is the retention of that intention. That's where the mindfulness comes in, smitten. Mm. So there's a beautiful theory of motivation or theory of action if you want. It is really embedded there. So the psychology 
really brings that out. And then, for example, we were talking about the, the you know, Abhidharma analysis of, you know, the opposite of diligence, which is laziness. Yes. And, uh, you know, Chandideva's, again, Chandideva's uh, Guide to the Bodhisattva way, uh, you know, unless you understand Abhidhamma psychology a little bit, it would be, you won't be able to appreciate another level of that text because it presupposes familiarity with certain yes. psychological insights that are in Abhidhamma. So for example, he, in the sixth chapter, uh, I think it's the seventh chapter in the chapter on Virya, it starts with analysis of the opposite of Virya, mm. diligence, which is laziness. Mm. And he identifies three forms of laziness. You know, normal in plain English, we tend to associate, you know, sort of equate laziness with yeah. procrastination. But you can see a deeper psychology in Abhidharma and, and Buddhist tradition when he says that laziness can take the form of procrastination, which is the standard one, always done of delay and push and push. All laziness can take the form of indulgence and habit, habitual activity. In other words, he's seeing this, although there is an energy in what you do, but he sees this as a form of laziness because it's a kind of an avoidance. Yeah, yeah. So, and some of us are familiar with this, you know, we, you know, that those who are write, writers, we know, for example, like, you know, we will avoid the time when you actually have to plunge and write. So we will use the excuse of, oh, I need, still need to take notes here, take notes there. You, Go around and around, yeah. and you never go straight. Yeah, yeah. So that's what he's talking about. There is this form of avoidance, which is essentially a form of laziness. Then he even says, uses the word self-contempt, yeah. a form of self-defeatism as a kind of a laziness, because that's what obstructs you. When you look at that, the psychology behind this is pretty impressive. It's so profound. Yeah, so profound. And of course, Shanideva is talking from the point of view of a practitioner. Yeah. You know, in order to practice, you have to make an effort, you have to embark on the path, you have to stick through it. Not only is it adequate to initially get the motivation, but you have to sustain the motivation. Mm. And Shandideva and other Abhidhamma masters emphasize the role of joy. Yeah. You know, they say that relying too much on will to sustain your motivation is not a good strategy. Will can get you there first, but will is effortful. Mm. And if you constantly rely on your will, you're going to be exhausted. Mm. But on the other hand, if you can get the, use the will to get in there, then find a joy in the pursuit, joy will sustain you. Yes. That's a much smarter strategy. Those are profound insights mm. in Buddhist psychology, you know? Yeah, I love it. And it's applicable not just to practice to everyday life. Yeah. yeah. Like, how can I have joyful energy? Yeah. To go throughout my day. Exactly. And yeah. there's like, here's the three steps. Exactly, yeah. So yeah. let's go through them. Right? <laughs> so the first step to get virya, yeah. this we call virya joyful energy. Energy, yeah. Right? Yeah. And the first one is uh, shraddha. Yeah. And what's that? It's the, the faith or the, the confidence. Faith. So yeah, but that, faith in what? that so, presupposes understanding the virtue, appreciating the value. Appreciating the value. The value yeah. So is this like having meaning? Having meaning, yeah. So first you start off, you say, I ha there's this... Thing that I want to do and it's meaningful because yeah. of X. Right? And it's That's valuable, it. it's, it's beneficial, yeah. it has all these virtues. So understand meaning. And obviously, if we don't have meaning, uh, a purpose, then um, you're, pleasure, you're going to be driven by yeah. pleasure. Yeah. And also, you're not going to be turning your mind towards it. That's yeah. the thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we've got, we need meaning. Yeah. And then what was the faith? Yeah. So the faith, faith in confidence. What? Yeah. Confidence in, the, in, in the pursuit. Confidence in the pursuit. Yeah. That I can actually achieve. This. Yeah, this, it's, it's, exactly. it's pr practical yeah. for me to go after yeah, exactly. this yeah. meaningful endeavor. Yeah. So we have meaning, we have and then uh, confidence. The, yeah. And then, and then there's then, an appreciation, which is sort of a more advanced form of conviction. Okay. Yeah. So tell me a little bit more about appreciation. Well, it's something that, you know, it's one thing to have interest, yeah. but something else to be actually convinced. Yeah. Yeah. So the, it's sort of, you can have interest of all sorts of stuff. Yeah. But interest, you have to act up in order to act upon it. You need to have a deeper conviction. Okay. So, you know, I really want to achieve this. Yeah. And then that will lead to enthusiasm. Okay. Okay. I got and it. And enthusiasm will give you the three. Yeah. So meaning. Yeah. Some meaningful Finding endeavor. Meaning. Yeah. Finding meaning. Understanding that it's practical for me. I yeah. can actually go for this. Yeah. And then I really want to go yeah. for this. Yeah. 
deepening the interest. And you've got these three steps, and then, then Virya will come, come yeah. and you'll go throughout your day with this joyful energy. Yeah, yeah. That, <laughs> that's what this is the understanding of the Buddhist Yeah, that's state. one, yeah. Fantastic. So this is what you're teaching us in this course, right? <laughs> one of them, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm wondering in this, like we went through 51 mental factors, factors right? And I'm wondering of those 51, uh, which do you think is the most misunderstood? Well, um, the, in the second category of the 51s are grouped into um, six categories. Uh, the second one, the first one is the omnipresent universal factors. They're five. And the second category is called object determinants. So they are kind of, they relate to specific types of objects. One of the five is mindfulness, smriti or sati in Pali. This is the one that is most misunderstood, mm. partly because there is a very influential contemporary usage of the term. And the Buddhist scholars have been complaining about the contemporary usage, but the train has gone, the train has left, okay? So we can't pull the train back. And my approach is always pragmatic. And in any case, even the Buddhist scholars who complain keep forgetting that mindfulness actually is an English term. <laughs> so, so what are we debating about here? Okay, are we debating about the meaning of the English term or are we debating about contemporary scholars, you know, or researchers, clinical scientists, misuse of the term which has already been chosen by Buddhist scholars to translate a particular term. So what exactly is this in dispute here? So my solution has been to really request to authors who are, you know, the clinical scientists and contemporary researchers in mindfulness field and Buddhist scholars, when they write for popular, you know, if you're writing in a Buddhist context, you use the classical definition of mindfulness. But if you're using in a contemporary literature, at least somewhere mention, you know, mindfulness as defined in the contemporary way. I mean, just, just, just alert it so that people don't confuse. I mean, the same thing like attachment. You know, attachment from the Buddhist tradition, we translate the word raga, which has this very clinging, self-referential aspect to it. And that is destructive. Mm. But then attachment from a developmental psychology point of view is a positive state of mind. And child, if they don't have a healthy attachment to their mother or caregiver, there's a trouble down the line. Mm. So if we use it in the right way by specifying what definition we're using, because in the end, Wittgenstein is right. The meaning of a word, it's, it's, it's use. Mm. And we cannot legislate, I mean, even though the French tries to do that, stipulate the meaning of a word by setting up an academy that is custodian of the language. And English language generally doesn't work like this. English language, if you look at the history of how Oxford, you know, um, dictionary was created, it was a bottom up approach. Mm. They outsource the words, the letters to individual researchers and ask them to do research and, you know, sort of uh, uh, list down the earliest usage of the term in publication and then specify the different meanings and senses in which the term has been used. So English, you know, understands, language understands that meaning evolves, mm. you know, and meaning cannot be stipulated. So same thing here. Mm. I don't think some of us Buddhist scholars, you know, can, can try to dictate how an English word <laughs> should be used, yeah. but it is a source of major misunderstanding. And there's been a, volume done on this entire problem of what mindfulness is. And part of the complication is also the two main Abhidhamma traditions, the Indo-Tibetan tradition on the one hand and the Theravada tradition on the other differ on how the mindfulness is defined. In the Theravada tradition mindfulness is a virtuous mm -hmm. mental quality and mental state. In the non-Theravada Indo-Tibetan tradition, um, in the Tibetan Buddhist, Tibetan Buddhism, it's it's not a virtuous uh, state of mind. It's a it's a neutral factor, and the reason for that is if you look deeper, if you dig deeper in the Abhidham, uh, Theravada Abhidhamma, mindfulness 
concept includes an, another concept, which is in the Indian and in Tibetan tradition, a distinct factor, which is abramad, you know, translated as conscientiousness or heedfulness. And that is a virtuous mental factor. So if you include abramad in mindfulness, then of course, mindfulness is going to be virtuous. So once you see the, the different definition, so that's partly the problem. And then there's a debate you know, between Buddhist scholars and including Theravadan scholars about whether mindfulness is virtuous or value neutral or is it, you know, and someone has even talked about, you know, uh, a sharpshooter can have a mindfulness, you know, I mean, like, so from Abhidhamma, Indo-Tibetan Abhidhamma perspective, yes, because it's a value neutral state of mind, but from a Theravada Abhidhamma perspective, no, because it's a sharpshooting, killing someone is a virtuous act, non-virtuous act. So, so I think there's a, part of the debate is sort of talking across each other, mm. uh, but yes, this term is, is a complicated one. So the mindfulness is one, um, attachment is another term that is really complicated. And then uh, faith is, or shraddha, there isn't a better word, yeah. because faith, particularly in English, because of the influence of Christian tradition, the word faith has a very strong cognitive proposition of belief connotation. I believe that. Whereas the Shraddha, the Tibetan word Thepa, has le there's a side of that, which is a conviction, yeah. which is more cognitive. You're convinced about something, but it has more of an emotional quality of a trust. Like I trust my father or I trust my teacher. Yeah. So Shraddha has, you know, Namala yeah. you know, you're not saying I believe in whatever my teacher says. Basically, when you say I have a theba shraddha in my teacher, you're basically saying I have a deep trust in my teacher. So it's a different kind of feeling. But those are things which we cannot work it out by choosing another word. You know, so so it's it's. I mean, this is one area where um, work in English, where the translation or written uh, in Buddhist uh, you know, kind of uh, subjects. Uh, in modern time is helpful because you have the facility to annotate it. Just to say to the reader, here I'm using this term in this mm -hmm. way. The original Sanskrit term, the Tibetan term has this dimension, but we're using this term. Yeah. We, Jimpa and I were talking about an idea for another course, and it's the, the course of the most mistranslated <laughs> words and why you shouldn't <laughs> use those translations. So we're thinking about that course. What do you think? Good idea, bad idea? <laughs> They're not that popular. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe we'll just do a Dharma chat on it. You know? <laughs> no, this is this is so valuable, so yeah. valuable to yeah. get your um, you know feedback as we go through courses like how the mind works sure. and clearing up some of the misunderstanding about these words and and also linking them together. Often we get these lists, yeah, but we don't understand how the different activities of the mind interact together. Yes. And then how those and also what is categories. the principle behind that? Yeah, that's the problem. Yeah. Why are we learning yeah. this list? And it's one thing for kids to learn the list. That's fine because we expect them to memorize them. Yeah. But it's something else when you bring that list to a grown-up, highly educated audience. You know, if you don't explain the principle behind that list, why that list, why in that particular order, mm. and why that grouping, so that we we would expect there to be some reason. You know, yeah, yeah. not a random list. Yeah, so this um, part of this course is not just learning t terminology. Yeah. Like the, the monk, young monks would it's learn this yeah. te terminology, yeah. but learning the reason behind yeah. why these lists are yeah. together. Why? Because you mentioned that uh, Asanga, he knew about other mental activities, yeah. but he chose these 51. It's true, true. And true. so why did he choose these 51? Why did he put them in this order? Yeah. And, now, and my sense is, um, you know, I mean, th this is. You know, in a way, what Asanga and Vasubandhu are trying to do and Theravada Abhidhamma is to create a map. It's a map of the mind. And His Holiness often talks about the need for, to develop true self-awareness and emotional awareness. You do need to have an internal map of your mind. So Abhidhamma taxonomy of mental factors is an attempt to have, create such a map. And one of the earliest, I would say, actually, I would claim that the Buddhist Abhidhamma represents the high, the earliest systematic attempt to map the mind. Wow. Yeah, I would argue that. I mean, they, historians may find 
counterexamples, but I, right at this point, I'm fairly confident. And if you look at the map, and maps are generally created for a reason. You know, a subway map would be very different from a map of landscape in New York City, because they're for different purposes. So map need not necessarily be an exact representation or mirror image of what you are trying to map. So then in that case, I would argue, at least in the mind of Asanga and Vasubandhu, when they were creating this map, for them, it was a comprehensive map. But comprehensive, not in the sense of exhaustive, because exhaustive map would include the description of everything. But comprehensiveness does not need to include everything. You know? So comprehensive in the sense that, what are they interested in? They're interested in understanding the mind, typology, key factors and faculties that are essential to have awareness of, mm. to develop, to apply, to overcome by a Buddhist practitioner whose primary concern is ethical living and meditative cultivation. Yes. So if you look at the 51 list of 51 mental factors, there is a comprehensive list. All the key factors that are essential for the pursuit of that objective, which is ethical living. Amazing. Yeah. One of the things that Jimpa points out in the course is that it's also the reason that we're learning this about the mind is to understand its luminous nature. Yeah. Asanga says that. Yeah. And that to understand that all these activities are not of the nature of the yeah. mind. Yeah. And that the nature of the mind is is luminous. And so and I pure. found that really yeah. pure. Yeah. So I found that really, you know, it's about ethical living, it's about how to meditate. Yeah. And it's also like the most deepest view as sure. well in some sure. ways. What's your hope for this course? Well, my hope is that, uh, and it's particularly kind of aimed at, um, you know, uh, people who have, you know, who have engaged with Buddhism for quite a while, done practice, they're familiar with various aspects of the Tibetan tradition, and who are looking to understand some of the deeper psychology underneath these practices and teachings. So it's also a chance to offer an opportunity to engage with the insights of the great Nalanda masters, particularly Asanga and Vasubandhu. When it comes to you know, psychology, these two masters reign supreme in so far as the Indian and Tibetan tradition is concerned. I think no one actually matches them, mm. so rivals them. And, and their texts are completely fully available in Tibetan tradition, Tibetan uh, language. So uh, just an offer, an opportunity to, you know, I see my role as a kind of a curator. You know, I sit in this very interesting midpoint between classical Buddhist training and monastic background on the one hand, with native Tibetan being my native language, then having been exposed to contemporary Western studies at Cambridge and later, you know, uh, science as well. And then by coincidence of becoming His Holiness's principal interpreter, my role and professional life has become very involved in interpretation across cultures and language. And, uh, and then, um, so one of the roles that I would like to pay, play here is to be the interpreter for these great masters, mm. like Asanga and Vazubandhu, because if you look at the text themselves, even if may, some of them may be translated, it's not that easy to engage because the, the terminology, the structure, the hierarchical kind of relation, it's, it, it presupposes a quite a uh, intimate familiarity with a particular classical Sanskrit literary style, and which often comes in the way for even an educated reader, unless you are familiar with that kind of style. So my role is to somehow cut through that because I'm doing this in English, and I'm not doing this as a commentary on a particular text, which, constrain, which would constrain me if I'm doing a commentary on a text, I have to follow the structure of that text. I'm taking the key ideas out and then repackaging them, if you want, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in a way that is accessible and that will speak to you. And me, you know, myself having been a lay person living in the West, living the life of contemporary you know, society like everybody else, you know, always chasing after time and, you know, constantly needing to find the ground in the, against all the force, 
winds that are sweeping us around social media, whatever. <laughs> so, and, and so I think, you know, in some ways I can empathize with the challenges that contemporary living poses. And in, with that awareness, I'm trying to create a time efficient, um, you know, way of conveying some of these insights that could be, and, and all from a very point of view of a practitioner. Mm. Because in the end, the Buddhist psychology or Buddhist philosophy is not in end in themselves. Mm. You know, they are in the service of something. They are in the service of the transformation of the mind, you know, purification of the mind yeah. for the whole. So let's finish on uh, for our little discussion, then we'll go to the Q&A. But let's sure. finish on what's next. What's the next course? What have we got to look, to look forward to next year? Well, um, I mean, I feel, uh, let me take this opportunity to express my deep gratitude to Wisdom Academy. Wisdom is providing me this platform because, um, you know, I, I am at heart a hermit. I don't mm -hmm. like to create communities. I don't like the responsibility of taking, looking after students. You know, I've always shied away from this. I'm a more of a hermit. I like working on my own, on texts. <laughs> And, uh, you know, once in a while, like Mind and Life and Compassion Institute, and there are others, but there are structures with other people will run. I'm happy to be part of it, but I myself, my own Tibetan, uh, Institute of Tibetan Classics is deliberately designed in a way that is, there is no empire building element to that. <laughs> it is only a vehicle to get those 32 volumes translated. Mm -hmm. It's as simple as that. So I feel grateful that Wisdom, you have a fantastic, online learning platform and um, you know uh, to have this opportunity for me to use your platform to share to the contemporary audience you know and to play this curating and interpreting role so what i have in mind is that we began with the high level philosophy yes, course Tsongkhapa. of Tsongkhapa Smadimaka. this one is abhidhamma psychology and uh, hopefully the next one would be on mind training lojong and i want to offer an opportunity for the Dharma students and those who are deeply interested in Tibetan tradition to go beyond the seven point mind training, to go a bit, dig, dig, you know, bit, uh, dig bit deeper and uh, not just on the history, but also the psychology behind Lojong because one of the key ideas behind Lojong is what I would call radical awareness, everyday awareness. It's, uh, it's, it's kind of a radical approach to cultivating everyday mindful awareness. Mm -hmm. And this whole Lojong slogan of whatever you encounter in the immediate, bring it into your practice. Mm. So there are quite a lot of important insights in the Lojong, which needs to be fleshed out. And another important idea in Lojong is what is called, um, you know, Redok uh, Bonyongpa. Yeah. So Redok is Rewa and Tokpa. Rewa and Tokpa is hopes and fears, hopes and apprehensions or expectations and apprehensions. And if you think about a default state of mind, science now shows us, as the Lojong masters were telling us, the default state of the mind is a ruminating state of the mind. And that rumination is often about you, often about me. And that often story has a tinge of expectation and fear, <laughs> you know, something, anticipation of something coming from the future. So that's one of the reasons why Mahamudra practice mm -hmm. is so powerful. Yeah because it's trying to cut through that. Mm. And Lojong does it in a different way. And Lojong has this roto gonyomba, means, you know, rewa and tokpa, hopes and fear, you level it out. And one of the main practices to you find that equanimity, that mm. evenness of mind, but Lojong does it without expecting you to sitting down quietly mm. for hours, okay? <laughs> so this Lojong is in some sense more direct approach. Um, so that's, one thing that often doesn't come through in the Lojong teachings. Yeah. And then Lojong also has this idea of different states of mind, like armor-like, you know, Vajra-like, you know, diamond-like. These are basically stances yes. that you are adopting. And this idea of adopting a stance, yeah. you know, isn't, doesn't come through in the popular Dharma teachings, even on Lojong. Because stance adoption suggests a proactive approach. A lot of our Lojong practices is reactive. Mm. But this taking a stance is a beautiful idea. So I want to flesh these out. Um, and, and then there are, you know, the great Tibetan. I mean, the Tibetan uh, literary tradition is very rich. I mean, 
we translated the entire the, the main collection, Bojong Yatsa, yeah, the great collection, but that does not exhaust all the Bojong wow. texts. So I want to look at some of the other specific genres. There is a beautiful text on a uh, super, you know, in patient through Bojong perspective. Uh, so there's a there, there are several types of and then kitu ronyamba is the you know the mixing the taste or fusing the taste of joy you know good fortune and bad fortune or in joy and sadness again the idea is not too much ups and downs yeah so there are you know and then of course lojong is very well known for resilience you know turning transforming adversities into opportunities and into path to enlightenment so those are that's a well known but anyway i would like to because that's actually one of my personal practices, Lojong. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why I first translated that volume. Mm -hmm. You know, even though some of the Gilu Gishis would have preferred that I do the mm -hmm. <laughs> Gilu volume first. <laughs> but I'm a big fan of Lojong and it's on my own personal practice. And I find the psychology behind the Lojong, the insight into how the human mind works. You know, there's a, this beautiful statement in one of the Lojong master's texts, he says that uh, one of the biggest challenges is our ego. And people, the bigger the ego, you are carrying a, a larger target behind your back. And when you are a big target, arrows can hit it from everywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, isn't that beautiful mm -hmm. image? <laughs> so, so the aim here is to shrink that target so that you don't get hurt yeah. easily. So they are powerful examples and teachings like this, which I have personally found very helpful. And there's a beautiful line attributed to uh, um, Atisha. He says that in relation to objects that normally give rise to attachment and aversion, anyone who can you know, uh, see them as spiritual teachings, mm -hmm. education opportunities, that person will be help happy anyway. Mm -hmm. I mean, isn't that powerful? It's a very simple, you know, so I would like to somehow find a way to convey these through a course, yeah. I can't wait. <laughs> and I think, I think Kestrel's just got a trailer for the next course right there. And um, I also want to mention, it's an honor to have you on the platform. So thank you, Jim Palau. Thank you. And it's true, it took a couple of years to convince him to get out in front of the camera and do this teaching. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to have a little bit of a break now, and then we'll come back. People can ask their um, questions to Jimpa, both in, in person and and on the internet and i'm sure people are thinking how the mind works this course uh when is it coming so it's coming uh september 29th and the cool thing about that course is you'll get throughout the 10-week course you'll get through three live q a's with uh, jim Pala, and that makes that extra special um i think i asked the team to give a huge discount to our uh, dharma chat friends so i think for tonight there's like a 150 dollars discount but the details are in the chat also i think we're gonna um you know, have this one out for everyone for fifty percent off if you're interested in these um, these amazing texts. So, just wanted to share that as well. And with that, we'll have a we'll have a, a five minute, ten minute break, and we'll be back for the Q and A section. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome everyone to Wisdom News for 2023. This is the first uh, edition of Wisdom News for this year. And the first thing I wanted to tell you all about was the new Wisdom Journal. The new Wisdom Journal should be dropping in your letterboxes any moment now. And in it, you'll find some beautiful excerpts from our latest books, like this one from Bhikkhu Bodhi's uh, latest anthology and uh, much, much more. We have lots of, uh, lots of different in-depth articles from a lot of our most recent books. So I think you'll enjoy that, it's coming soon. Don't forget there's a 20% uh, code on the back page here to be used on pretty much any of our books. You can get 20% off at our website. So I wanted to share that news. And don't worry if you're not signed up to the Wisdom Journal because you can easily sign up by going to wisdomexperience.org. And if you go to the Explore page and go down to the Wisdom Journal um, tab here, and you'll come to this page 
and then if you scroll down you'll be able to see, see receive the print edition. If you put your name there and address, city, uh, email and press submit then we'll send you the next edition of the Wisdom Journal and it'll be in your letterboxes. We hope everyone's enjoying the journal. Okay, let's talk about some books. I've got a heap of books I want to share with you. Uh, these are new books from Wisdom. And let's start with Nagarjuna's Advice for Buddhists. Um, so this is Geshe Sopa's commentary on the great Indian philosopher Nagarjuna's uh, famous text, Letter to a Friend. Uh, Nagarjuna wrote that um, text as advice to a king. Geshe Sopa shows us how uh, Nagarjuna's advice um, to follow Buddhist ethics applies um, today just as well as it did back in the day when Nagarjuna composed it. Um, Beth Newman has done a fantastic job capturing um, these teachings from Geshe Sopa and, um, and making them into a book. So this is um, like, and I really like what um, Yang Sivan Bache says here. He says, um, Geshe Sopa was a lineage holder of our time and having his teachings on Nagarjuna's letter in his words will be of great benefit for us. Um, so this, this will be a fantastic book for everyone interested in Nagarjuna and also wanting a modern, modern advice on these verses. So the next book we're going to talk about is uh, The Swift Path. So this is The Swift Path. Um, it's the meditation manual on stages of the path to enlightenment written by the second Panchen Lama. Uh, this book is considered one of the eight great lamb rims and in this book, The Swift Path, Panchen Lama uh, expands on his earlier meditation guides and basically this gives us detailed meditation instructions on how to generate a clear and profound meditation experience on the stages of the path. It's a uh, part of the w Wisdom Culture series and it also comes out in March. And um, as, as we can see here, it's a collection of guided meditations from the 18th century Tibet, um, harnessing elements of tantric visualization while contemplating the steps on the path to Buddhahood. So this is a fantastic book for those who love the Lam Rim genre and uh, following uh, the Dalai Lama's teachings and uh, the Gulug School's teachings. The next uh, book we're going to talk about is for people who have s received initiation into Chittamani Tara. So this is the secret revelations of Chittamani Tara, uh, generation and completion stage practices and commentary. Uh, this book is out now. Um, so this book is for those who have received the Chittamani Tara empowerment. Chittamani Tara is the highest yoga tantric aspect of Green Tara. Um, and this book contains many um, profound oral instructions uh, that, are not, that are not found easily elsewhere and are particularly uh, really good uh, instructions on completion stage practice. Uh, these instructions are said to have come from Chittamani Tara herself. And so this book, it includes the self-generation sadhana, the Gana Chakra offering, and um, so it's not just uh, how to practice, it's got the liturgical prayers as well. Um, and as I said, it's a restricted text for those who have um, received the Chittamani Tara initiation and practice that lineage. So the next book I want to talk about is Sounds of Innate Freedom, uh, Volume 3. So this is Volume 3 in the sixth volume uh, series of, uh, that Karl Brunholtzl is uh, translating for us. Um, and this third volume can be considered the Sadaha volume, actually. So, you know, this series is six volumes. It contains many of the first English translations of this classic Mahamudra literature that was compiled by the seventh Kamapa, uh, drawing on the Indian text on uh, Mahamudra. So this third volume contains 24 texts, the bulk of which are Dohas by uh, Sadaha. That's why we're calling this the Sadaha volume. And uh, it's fantastic for people who uh, love the Doha literature, love the sort of you know, primary text on Mahamudra, we can think about these texts, and it's a huge, it's a huge book. So, um, Carl's done an enormous effort uh, translating these texts for us, and so that one is also available right now. And then another very special uh, guest coming in June, and that's Kundra Sering uh, Kunga Buma. Kundra is coming to our New York office here, and so we'll have an in-studio audience. And um, please join us if you can. But don't worry if you can't, because we'll have the Zoom. We'll have a Zoom audience as well. And um, I think maybe there'll be a chance to um, ask uh, Kandrala some questions as well. So this is a very, very unique uh, opportunity and an amazing June coming up for us, where we'll have um, Tupton Jimpa and Dharma chats followed by Kandrala. So that's it for Wisdom News. That was a lot. We haven't done it for a while. Thank you for uh, listening. Um, I hope some, there's something there for everyone. 
and uh, we'll do another update in a couple of months. In the meantime, hope to see you at Dharma Chats. Thank you so much. Oh, we're on. Sorry, everyone. Welcome back. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. And now it's over to you guys. We're going to ask Jimbala your question. Um, we're going to start with a live question here in the audience. Ethan has a question for Jimbala. Uh, we'll just try to set this up first. Um, so, um, Jim, this is my first one. And, uh, the first book I read on etching was Jeffrey Robson, and it was translated as Echoes of Voidness. Every other book had a different translation. And then you gave a, a, a lecture once at one of the translation gatherings, and you said something which is very helpful. So thank you. And what you said was the Sanskrit, the Tibetan, the word has no meaning without the context. So the same word can be used in multiple times with different contexts, different tools, different philosophies. 
uh, in English, I can't remember the word you use, but something like we have the arrogance or the assumption that we can pinpoint the definition of one word <laughs> and use that. So my question for you is, um, what are some of the challenges you've had navigating that space over the years? Uh, and you know, it was clearly about emptiness, but I'm really sort of interested generally about sure. that challenge. Thank you. That's a, a really, uh, you want to repeat the question? <laughs> Can you just, do you want to give the essence? I think the essence is um, when translating words like emptiness, often um, the translation needs to be in context. And so what challenges have you had um, finding the right? Yeah. So, um, um, I mean, translation by its very nature, is an activity that tries to convey a meaning from one set of symbols across another set of symbols. Um, in an ideal world, you know, language users in different communities would have carved the pie in the same way so that we could find the exact equivalent from this pie to another piece of pie on the other. But that's not the reality how language works because language is an attempt to articulate human experience, including what we see. And so different languages are going to have a slightly different take on this. So one of the things that I've always resisted right from the beginning is an attempt to pair one Tibetan word with one English word and be consistent. Uh, you may be consistent, there's a virtue, but in the process you lose the richness of the meaning. And that's where my comment about context comes from. For example, there's a Tibetan word, rig, often translated as lineage. But rig also means kind or type. And rig can also connote family. Okay? So if you translate rig with one English word, then you are limited by the very choice you make uh, of conveying the richness of the meaning of that one term. Because English, when you compare it to Tibetan, has a much larger vocabulary. And English handles expression, expressibility in a different way by using more words in the right word in the right context. Tibetan handles the same challenge because language ultimately aims to convey an experience. And if the, if the language succeeds in it, that's the purpose of language. And language may succeed it in the English way, which is choosing multiple words, which can be the exact one in the one's context. Or you can have a single term that can mean differently in different contexts. And that's the, the route the Tibetan approach tends to take. So because these two languages handle the expressibility in a slightly different way, the project of pairing one Tibetan word, one English word is doomed to failure right from the start. And it also does no justice to the Tibetan, nor to the English. Because in the end, for a translator, you have two responsibilities. One is to the author that you are translating. There's a kind of a loyalty, fidelity. But you have an equally important responsibility, which is the communication to the reader. And that communication is done through the second language, the object language. And if you, by choosing one word to another word, you may serve the purpose of consistency, but in the end, you're also not doing a good service to the author because the author in the end wants to communicate. <laughs> so, and if you're not able to communicate, and translation doesn't serve the purpose. So it's, it's a challenging one, but I think this is one area where, you know, when I, many years ago, uh, I raised funds to uh, do, start a workshop on Tibetan, uh, English trans, translating from Tibetan into English, the Library of Tibetan um, Works and Archives in Dharamsala. So Michel Atola was very, very interested and he now runs it now, but the initial I was involved. And when I gave the workshop, basically, and they're all Tibetans, there were some Western students, but majority Tibetans. And I said, first of all, 
the basic principle of translation is ideally that you translate it into your own language. So people translating in from Tibetan to English should be native English speakers. So in some sense, my own example violates that <laughs> principle. I'm not a native English speaker. But then those who are not native English speakers have a bigger challenge because in the end, the end product is not in your language. It's in the object language, which is English. In which case, if there is one area where the translators need to really cultivate, especially for non-natives, then the effort has to be put on acquiring a high level of mastery of English. So I gave a copy to all the workshop participants, the slim book, which is one of my favorite called Elements of Style. <laughs> and I told them, you should read this, feel this. And then I also, I'm a big fan of uh, Penguin Classics translation of the Dhammapada, which turns out to be not that accurate, but the English is beautiful. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I gave a copy of that too. And I said, just feel the language. You know, don't leave the language here. You feel it. You feel it's poetry. You feel it's music. You know, so so when you translate, the in the end, the language that matters most is the language you, into which you are translating, because that's your product. So I think those are important considerations for translation. Thank you, Jinpa. Um... You know, you mentioned there's a difference between the way uh, Theravada explained mindfulness and the Indo-Tibetan explained mindfulness. Yeah. That's generated a lot of sort of buzz on, on the chat. Yeah. And one of the questions seems to be, um, is there a definition that covers both? Because if you're talking to scientists or just like, you know, the everyday person, and you say Buddhists uh, mean this by mindfulness, is there a way of doing that? Well, I think in terms of the actual functionality of, of smriti or sati, there's a convergence mm. in a consensus. Its primary character is the function of retention. Mm. And also its object is something that is familiar. And then, and then it's sort of, you know, um, serves as a, as, a, as a basis to retain that, you know, um, single pointedness. Mm. So I think, the key um, kind of, you know, aspects, I think they're the same. Mm -hmm. But the difference is in the Theravada, because they bring the Ab Abramada yeah. concept into it, it has a virtuous quality. Whereas in the Indo-Tibetan tradition, it's a neutral state of mind. So I think, you know, we, I mean, you know, whether it's virtuous or not, it's really in the end, um, defined by kind of this presence or absence of contentiousness. Yeah. So, so is it pretty much exactly the same, except for the Theravada say that conscientiousness has to accompany yeah. mindfulness? Mindfulness, yeah. It's and other than that, that, when they say mindfulness, they're meaning the same thing? Same, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. 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 So That's how good. I would uh, resolve that uh, yeah. you know, perceived tension. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions here? You can just raise your hand, yeah. 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 No, no, heedfulness is what a term I use normally. Yeah, if I, yeah. Yeah. You want to repeat the question? Um, so there's a question about um, whether it's, there's a great value to 
because um, there's a lot of emphasis on mindfulness, mindfulness yeah. and whether there's um, value to emphasize heedfulness, heedfulness yeah. as well, along with those teachings. Um, I mean, uh, there has been a lot of debates um, lately in the literature about the ethical status of mindfulness per se. In fact, I even wrote a paper called The Question of Mindfulness and Its Relation to Compassion and Ethics. Um, and I argued that um, at least you know, mindfulness as it is defined in contemporary context, uh, it should be recognized, it's better recognized as value neutral. Um, you know, because here we're looking at a particular factor and faculty that is being developed where the attentional quality seems to be the key factor and this non-judgment. And, you know, and the meta awareness is being applied, which is a neutral, value neutral activity, and which is has a huge clinical potential. And for example, like for the prevention of relapse of depression, mindfulness added to the cognitive behavioral therapy seem to really make a big difference because mindfulness component helps the patient to not to get sucked into the rumination spiral by adopting this distance and observing their own mind in a detached way. And it's, it's a powerful activity, but it's a value neutral activity. And this is how you know, contemporary clinical science, even though Buddhist teachers may, many of them are Theravadan masters, may insist mindfulness is virtuous. But if you look at the actual clinical you know, uh, literature and the practice that is being introduced, it's a value neutral practice. So I think it's just being very clear about this is helpful. And then if you want to bring the added virtuous quality, then bringing heedfulness, which is a separate construct. You know, it's a, a pramada is a separate construct. It's a separate factor. Uh, and, you know, bringing this in uh, would be really helpful uh, because a pramada is really uh, this, this, this quality of the mind that allows you to exercise caution with the awareness of the values that you uphold. So, I mean, you know, imagine all of these will make more sense in a concrete terms if you think of these being, you know, prescribed to a monk, a monastic member, you know, who is committed to living his life or her life according to certain precepts, is going about in the everyday world is going to be constantly challenged by situations which may tempt the infraction of some of the precepts. And a brahmada or this heedfulness is what gives you this proactive sense of caution that will always give you the ability to remember your precepts. You know, remembering is the mindfulness. You know, retention is the mindfulness. Heedfulness is the cautionary stance that will allow you and that heedfulness presupposes that you want to avoid infractions. There's a value proposition there. <laughs> so I think this is where you know, it, a lot of these become real and concrete if you kind of you know, situate in the context of a monastic member or a bodhisattva practitioner who has a vow. And then what are the resources? Because you don't want to be relying on your conscious will all the time. You know, that's one of the reasons why rules are made so that you have a shorthand, shortcut to the access to the, to the precepts that you have. Because if you rely on constantly on will, we discussed how that's not a, help, that's not a smart strategy. <laughs> so, so I think you know, uh, this distinction between abramad, conscientiousness or heedfulness and mindfulness is a useful one. Because if you look at the clinical literature, even though many of the teachers who are, many of the teaching from which the clinical research is based is coming from Theravada teaching on mindfulness, which takes their mindfulness to be virtuous, but in the actual practice that it being, the, to, to use the scientific language, the actual intervention, mindfulness intervention that is being introduced is a value neutral activity. So it's basically to do with you know, being, you know, remaining in the present moment, paying conscious attention, not rushing to judgment, okay, and observing. 
That's a value neutral activity. And hence, one of my colleagues example of a mindful sniper. You can see all of that in that activity. You know, there's no contradiction. Yeah, Shantideva might add um, to those two suggestions, yeah? Yeah. Meta-awareness. Meta-awareness, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and also one of the complications is that in contemporary teachings on mindfulness, often the role of meta-awareness is not that explicit. So in the word mindfulness, the meta-awareness also seems to be collapsed yeah. into that. So that's it yeah, yeah. sort of, it's, it's, right now the meaning hasn't fully settled. You know, everybody's throwing the word around because there's a lot of research being done. There's a lot of money being poured in. There are thousands of books saying mindful this <laughs> and mindful that, and because that's the current kind of craze, but hopefully things will settle down because things can never stay like this, you know, until things settle down. But, uh, you know, I think it's, um, my sense is that people are now beginning to have a second look. You know, that's one of the reasons why I wrote that paper. There was a special collection of the whole debate on mindfulness versus whether it is decontextualized, whether it's being misappropriated, what is the relationship with you know, sati and smriti. And in my paper, I made the suggestion that it is not a good idea to try to figure out whether it is an accurate translation of sati or smriti, or whether you know, the contemporary mindfulness description is being faithful to the tradition. I said, I don't think it's a good, helpful, pursuit because the modern mindfulness has emerged in a particular context. It's being helpful, it's beneficial. So why don't we just take it in its own right than trying to force the Buddhist definition, classical Buddhist definition onto it. So we're well into our discussion on terms already. <laughs> We've already started <laughs> making the discussion. Uh, so next question from the online audience. Uh, Dijimpa, can you comment on the mother of Asanga and Vasubandhu? Uh, my understanding that was is that she was a very learned nun who decided to have two children in order to benefit the Buddhist teachings. Uh, she was also their first teacher. Is that, is that right? I don't know. I mean, that's one of the, um, uh, thank you for the question. Um, we do know that uh, both, you know, Asanga and Vasubandhu were born in uh, modern day Pakistan, Peshawar. Um, and uh, both of them, it looks like their initial training was done in Sarvastivada, Abhidharma. Um, but beyond that, there is a biography of uh, Vasubandhu in the Chinese uh, language uh, by Paramartha, which is where some of this information comes from. But other than that, there's very little reliable um, you know, information about the actual life okay. uh, of, of the, both of the both yeah. brothers. Yeah. And so that that um, biography is way late. Is rather later, late. yeah. Yeah, later. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's that's one of the actually downside of many of the Indian great masters. Yeah. They don't seem to be much information in the form of biography. So whether it is Nagarjuna or Aryadeva, or there's a lot of kind of legends around about yeah. them, and even Shantideva, there's a lot of legend, but we don't really have much concrete you know, sort of facts about, um, other than being able to, you know, guess their period. From the text. Yeah. From the text, yeah. So, uh, and maybe that's deliberate. Maybe, yeah. you know, the, the, the great masters in the past were not that enamored about themselves. You know? yeah. <laughs> and maybe the Asian tradition wasn't that keen on doing glorifying individuals yeah. by writing biographies, even though the Buddha's biography is fairly detailed, yeah. you know. So it might um, mean that we didn't lose those texts, they never existed. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. And that's a possibility. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I... even in Tibet, I think, uh, you know, right now I'm working, hoping to work on uh, modern biography of Sakya Pandita. And, uh, you know, I was talking to some of the Sakya scholars, and the tradition for writing extensive biography, even in Tibet, seemed to have emerged a bit later mm. uh, because there's not that much on Sakya Pandita as well, it was a giant in the history of Tibetan intellectual tradition. Yeah. So probably in the Buddhist tradition, the emphasis on no self might have played a role in. <laughs> so it's a good sign. <laughs> they practice what they teach. <laughs> um, what is your approach on the, the school of thought that says that Vasubhan, the later Vasubhan, is more of a Shara, uh, the three nations 
Yes, so, yes, uh, yeah. Do you subscribe to that? Do you uh, have opportunities in the first? Yes, this is a question about uh, yoga, you know, Vasubandhu, the later is more of a yoga chara master. Um, um, yes, that's true. I mean, I, I think there is, um, you know, the modern, some modern scholars have uh, had difficulty with that and uh, suggest a proposed solution which involves having two different Vasubandhus, which I don't subscribe to. It just doesn't make, make sense because if you, in order to solve a problem, you know, if you invent another one, that opens up a whole can of worms. So generally, uh, I'm a big believer in Occam's razor principle. The less, you know, unless there is a huge reason for explanatory principle, um, there's no point in, you know, adding something new. And, and this is a basic approach yeah. in Buddhism. And in Buddhism, for example, you know, when Buddhist, Buddhist tradition rejects uh, theism, the basic argument is that positing, you know, original creator doesn't give you any ex extra explanatory power. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's a, one of the, the, the strongest arguments. So then on top of that, by creating a whole metaphysical construct, you, it opens up a can of worms. Yeah. You have explained it, what is then the relationship between what is eternal to the phenomenal reality? What is the principle that connects the two? How can you have a cause that is uncaused and eternal? You know, I mean, there's no act, causal yeah. activity. So, Similarly, Buddhist rejection of self is again based upon the idea that you can explain all the phenomenal facts of everyday experience of a human being or sentient being without supposing an eternal principle like an Atman. Mm. So it's, a, it's a, you know, the Buddhism tends yeah. to use this Occam's razor principle as well. Yeah. So the proposition that we should have two Vasubandhus doesn't seem to, it seems to add more complication than, and so I think that Tibetan traditions take is that um, Vasubandhu began his career as a Sarasthivada Abhidhamma, and then when he was writing the auto commentary on his own text, and even when he was writing the root text on the treasury of Abhidhamma, every now and then he throws in a, sort of a, 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 a kind of a, a, in Tibetan we use word ser lo tag, says they say, it is said. To suggest that he himself is not that comfortable with that statement, you know, and he throws that even in the root text, mm. and he then fleshes them out much more extensively and explicitly in his auto commentary, where many of his views are contrary to the Sarvastivada Abhidhamma, and so much so that someone else wrote uh, what they call a better commentary on the root text <laughs> than himself. So, but. Later, Vasubandhu, you know, followed Mahayana tradition, you know, by influence by his, you know, brother Asanga. And if you look at Vasubandhu's um, discourse on the five aggregates, which are used in the common, you know, course, um, the list of fifth ornamental factors is exactly the same as you know. Mm -hmm. And then the framing of the five aggregates is very similar to his brothers. And then if you look at uh, Vasubandhu's commentary on uh, ornament of script and you know, Mayana Sutras, Sutra Alamkara, and uh, differentiation of the middle and extreme. It's very Yogacara. Yeah, yeah. It's very Yogacara. And, uh, and his 20 verses and 30 verses are beautiful texts. And his argument for the perception only perspective is very powerful. So I think he genuinely means it. And his critique of uh, you know, a reduction of atoms you know, his critique of atomism is still, you know, very powerful. I mean, it's just, so I think, you know, this Yogacara became, sort of, Vasubandhu became a Yogacara seemed to be borne out by the textual evidence, yeah. People can change their intellectual views as well. Yeah. Like in a thousand yeah. years, the scholars might be saying, there must have been two vegan sites. <laughs> it's true, true, true. Yeah. 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 Uh, there's a question about what level of understanding of Tibetan Buddhism is required for this book? This uh, stages in the past. Well, this collection, because it starts from Lamrim, mm. um, I would argue that it requires a bit of deeper interest and commitment on the reader. Yeah. But beyond that, I would argue that you could actually start from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's because the Lamrim practices are really right from the beginning, you know, from the turning your mind to Dharma. You know, turning your mind to Dharma doesn't presuppose you know about the three jewels or all the rest. 
So I would argue that, you know, and hope, you know, one of the things that I try to do when I translate from Tibetan to English, I always imagine what it must sound like if you don't read Tibetan. Because in the end, the translation has to stand on its own feet. You know, the readers of the translation has no access to the original mm. Tibetan, unless you read Tibetan, in which case we have a direct page reference number to the original mm. Tibetan. But the, the main purpose of these translations is to help the English reader. So, and in fact, uh, you know, I may be giving part of my secret away a little bit, but when I translate the final product, I actually read aloud in English. Because quite often, what may look like making sense when you read it aloud, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. So, so that's I think I would urge translators, even if English is your native language, to cultivate that habit. A lot of the best authors in the world do that. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. 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 okay, yeah. okay, okay. People are asking, "What are these books?" <laughs> okay. We never got to these books. Can you? Maybe you could um, hold this one up and show this one. And this is the fourth volume yeah. of Science and Philosophy in the Buddhist Classics. So these are four volumes in a series very dear to His Holiness the Dalai Lama's heart. His Holiness the Dalai Lama had often, you know, has been often talking about the wisdom of the Nalanda tradition and how the Tibetan tradition is a custodian of that great Nalanda wisdom. And one of the things that he has done, which is very innovative, is that His Holiness has argued that when you look at the great Buddhist texts, you know, even though they were written by Buddhist monks, most, most of them, for a monastic, you know, for an, a Buddhist audience, but he says that in principle, we should be able to distinguish between three categories of subject matter. One is what he would call science, kind of, you know, in a, in a broader sense, which is an attempt to describe the nature of reality. What, is, what are out there? you know, how things connect with each other. You know, how does the causal principle and the pens, you know, how did the cosmos come into being? How did sentient creatures come on this, you know, mm. earth? You know, how does, uh, so all of this is a Buddhist attempt to present a scientific understanding of nature of reality, of both matter and mind. Then the second category of the subject matter is philosophy and its attempt to articulate the deeper truth. You know, philosophy is at the conceptual level, trying to get a big picture of why we are here, what is the meaning of existence, you know, what is the nature of truth, you know, can human beings attain enlightenment, can the mind be perfected? They're the deeper questions. And what is the nature of mind? What is the relationship between cognition and emotion? So there are all these questions. These are kind of philosophical, and can human mind ever access the ultimate truth? Is ultimate truth completely beyond, you know, our accessibility? All of these are deeper questions. And how, you know, is the, is the reality that we observe in a day-to-day -day basis of this matter, is that real, or is it a construct that we create? And underlying that is a truer reality, which is what a lot of Indian traditions would argue, or are ultimately everything empty, like the, as the Madhyamagas would argue. So these are deeper philosophical questions. And his holiness argues that they are not religious in their nature. They are attempt to articulate the quest and inquiry by which you, you know, go through the quest. And some of the answers you find through this quest, that's a whole domain of philosophy. And these first two categories of subject matter, he says should be universal should be shared, should be out there in the world, you know, alongside multiple perspectives about reality that is out there. And so this is in the third category is of course the really Buddhist religious aspect. And he says, that's for the Buddhists, <laughs> okay? <laughs> but the first two are really should be shared. There's no reason why they should be hidden away in this <laughs> difficult text, which non-Buddhists don't read and the attempt here is to distill those first two aspects. And he uh, brought together a group of scholars in Dharamsala. Initially, um, outline was created, 
questions were created and it was sent out to the monastic members whose job was to divide it up. All the canon, 300 and something volumes, particularly 220 something Hingo, the treatises of great Indian masters, and basically look through this and just make a compilation of all the relevant passages from these texts. And then the, the, the group of editors in Dharamsala under my supervision, I was the chief editor, and then looked at all that collated material and then put them together in a coherent way with an essay. So it's a, it's a really, and then this is the translation and wisdom did all four of them in a beautiful way because the first two volumes are on science. One, the first one is on material science, matter. Second one is on mind science. And the idea of science from Buddhism in a, is, a, is a new idea because generally when people think of science, people think of Western science. And His Holiness is making the case that science as an inquiry method is actually quite universal. And whether we may call science in the present way or not, at least many of the things that the great masters like, you know, Vasubandhu and Asanga, they were doing was actually scientific. There's a scientific element. So for the first two volumes, because it's a novel way, completely re revolutionary way of presenting the Buddhist material to help the reader, you know, the poor reader, you know, <laughs> uh, we um, had essays. So for the volume on matter, I wrote the essays, there are six parts, and each section begins with an essay that guides the reader, that, you know, on taking through the terrain this particular section covers and making connection to the more familiar science. So they're using the familiar to introduce the unfamiliar and demonstrating that what's happening here is truly kind of in a spirit of scientific inquiry. And for the second volume, which is a science, you know, the science of mind, uh, my colleague mm. John Dunn mm. did the essays. Uh, each of the six sessions have an essay. And again, John Dunn made the connection with the contemporary psychology, psychological sciences, and especially the contemporary clinical research, and connecting them with the Abhidharma mental taxonomy and Dharma and epistemology, and you know, with the cognitive science and so on. So the first two volumes have, uh, you know, special essays. Uh, uh, from from us, and then the next two volumes are on philosophy. The third volume is actually an encyclopedia of Indian philosophy, so both Buddhist and non-Buddhist. So the the most important schools of Indian tradition: Samkhya, Nyayaka, Mimamsa, Vaishashika, um, you know, Vedanta, Jayana. Um, so they are all done uh, comprehensively with the Buddhist um, as the last school in there. So it's a survey of Indian mm -hmm. philosophy. In, in Tibet, there were a genre of text called philosophical mm -hmm. tenets or dutta, that kind of a, a, a kind of a dosography mm -hmm. type, a dosographical material. So this is an attempt to do it because the difference is in the traditional Buddhist encyclopedia of Indian philosophy, because it's done by Buddhists with certain agenda, they will present the non-Buddhist views, but then they will smash them down. <laughs> <laughs> so in this particular volume, because we are doing it in the spirit of pluralism, so we present faithfully the standpoints of all the schools without offering the Buddhist critiques. From their own uh, texts, yeah? From the, you know, so basically the presentations are really kind of uh, from their own point of view, from their own text. Mm. And then the final volume, it's this one, and uh, this one is a, is is a you know basically it's a, it's a thematic. So we chose uh, the nature of reality formulated in terms of two truths. Um, there is the uh, nature of self as another topic, and then there is um, uh, ultimate reality according to Yogacara, the whole kind of Chitta Mantra mind only with Yogacara and uh, Vasubandhu and Asanka is the key. And Dharma Kirti, and then a chapter on ultimate reality according to Madhyamaka, which is the whole philosophy of emptiness. Then there is one chapter on Buddhist epistemology, Bhignaga and Dharma Kirti are the main kind of, you know, this theory of knowledge, theory of perception, concept formation, and all of this. So many of the topics in con co contemporary cognitive science are covered there. And then the final chapter is philosophy of language. 
and from the Buddhist point of view, is the Apoha theory, differentiation theory of meaning. Um, so it's a very comprehensive um, volume. So the, the next the two volumes on philosophy, uh, other than a very lengthy introductory essay from the translators, we don't need to have a separate section kind of you know essays. So I'm mm -hmm. I'm deeply privileged to be part of this, uh, both for the English editor for the English series as well as you know editor for the Tibetan series, which actually involved quite a lot of yeah. my time. Yeah. I may have spent. I actually, at one point, I clocked the time, yeah. and over a period of four years, I had to spend nine months full time on the Tibetan. Just on the, on the wow, yeah, yeah. So, but it was a real service to his holiness, and it, you know, this is very dear to his holiness. Yeah. He's the one who conceived it. He's the one who structured it. He's the one who proposed the content, and um, the. The, the outline of the final settled version of the Tibetans were completely read out to him. Yeah. He made some changes and suggestions, but uh, basically he told the editors, make sure Jimpa's happy. <laughs> <laughs> you, work, you work really hard on this series. Yeah, yeah. It's an incredible series. Actually, Jimpa and I went to, earlier in the year, went to Bodh Gaya and presented His Holiness with this volume yeah. and, and let His Holiness know that we had fi finished the job. Yeah, yeah, yes. And uh, His Holiness was incredibly happy. He was. We had a little interview with him and that we'll, we'll put that out um, yeah. soon. Yeah. And His Holiness was bringing home the power of reasoning. That yeah. was his message. That was, was his crit critical thinking. Mm, critical that was thinking. his most important mm. message. He said critical thinking. Yeah. yeah. And so, the Nalanda tradition's greatness lies in the reasoning, the critical thinking. So Jimba, we have hundreds more questions, but unfortunately we're coming to the end of our time. Um, I'm sure everyone would sit around here and listen um, and ask you questions until the, the sun comes up, but uh, we have to be compassionate to Jimba. <laughs> Jimba, go to bed. So um, I just wanted to give you any, um, you know, the final, final message for people. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I think um, one of the things that I want to share with the English speaking audience is that we are truly living in a very, you know, a fortunate time. Of course, there's a lot of crazy things happening in the world, but from the point of view of a Buddhist material, Buddhist practice, you know, we now, unlike 50 years ago, we now have quite a lot of resources in English. Mm -hmm. And also the vocabulary and the language and the presentation and the translation is beginning to settle down so that you have a much more mature, you know, products like the Library of Tibetan Classics series and many other books being produced. So, you know, now we are not running short of resources. Mm -hmm. So the only thing that will keep us behind in the English speaking world is the, the lack of time investment we make. So I think it's, um, for me, as someone who grew up in India in the Tibetan monastery and having had the good fortune accidentally to become his holiness interpreter and then thus thrusting me into this role as a curator uh, and an intermediary. It's a really uh, very rewarding, and fulfilling and joyful to see that how many of the insights and teachings of the great Nalanda masters and the Tibetan masters are increasingly becoming available. And also the language is becoming normalized. You know, you no longer feel when you're reading an English text, you're reading, you feel kind of alienated, like right? strange kind of, you know, but now it's, it's a much more friendly language. It's a, it's a much more naturalized, settled language that I think, you know, sometimes we just think, take things for granted yes. and we only see the good fortune only when you make a comparison. So I think that's something that I wanted to share with you. And for me, uh, even though, you know, I did not succeed as a monk, but to have the opportunity to continue to spend my entire time and life with these texts, you know, with the memory of the great masters, you know, you know, it's, it's a real privilege, you know, it's, it's, it's a service. And, um, you know, like projects like this, it's very dear to my own guru, His Holiness's heart. And His Holiness is, you know, there's a, there's a saying in Shantideva's text where he says the the enlightened Buddhas have only one concern at their heart, it's the welfare of sentient beings. That is his holiness. Mm. The moment he wakes up, he thinks about the world, he thinks about the sentient beings. And, you know, one of the gifts 
good fortune I've had is to be able to be a, a medium for him, mm -hmm. to be that. And then, you know, if I were to be working on my own, my ability to impact people would be very limited. Mm -hmm. But being a medium for him, I've had the good fortune to be able to impact so many mm -hmm. by being the messenger, being the, you know, being the mouthpiece. And that I feel, I mean, you know, so God is right. Rejoice. Hmm. Rejoice in your own good fortune and rejoice in the good fortune of others. So I wanted to share that uh, with all of you. And I'm committed to, you know, I've been also very gifted with a, you know, very stable family life, um, support from people who have trust in my work. And also, um, I've been also very, very healthy. You know, I, you know, I often... So many of my Gishe colleagues said, how come you all just, you, know, you never get sick? I said, well, I have served two gurus. You know, my teacher, Jinnara Muche, he suffered stroke. And at our, at our household, we nursed him for 12 years. And in, in the early stages, I was among there. We massaged him every day wow. with oil. We bathed him every day. So I, I had a good fortune to you know, physically serve him. Then I have served His Holiness for over 37 years now. So I said, if, if I have a good you know, luck with my health, it's probably a good karma yeah. <laughs> of being served. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Jimpa. You're an absolute treasure. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Please check out the course, um, How Your Mind Works, or How the Mind Works, uh, the new course from Jimpa coming soon in September. Um, rejoice. Good night. Thank you. <laughs>